I hear a lot of stories and comments uh, on this crazy subject of finding the right girl or finding the right person to spend the rest of your life with. Taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture at whole, it all boils down to everyone basically saying the same thing, that they want a perfect girl, a perfect person. And when he mentioned about how unreasonable unre that is, they say, well, she doesn't have to be perfect, but she can't do this, and she has to do that. Now, I find it hilarious how uh, to hear that kind of stuff from people, how picky they are. Has it always been like that? It's hard for men to be picky when uh, women are also so picky. It's almost impossible to find common ground these days, sometimes. Well, I guess that's one reason for the uh, divorce rate being so high. But has it always been like that? Is it that some women are gold diggers while the other women just want financial security? Which either way leads to money. So the less financially stable dudes are shit out of luck while they nibble on the scrappings of leftovers from the dinner table of the elite class, if they get any at all. You may, you may ask yourself the logical explanation of that, and some of you may not even think about it, but that probably depends on your age range, mostly, then generation after that, what generation you belong to. But if a girl is talking to two different good-looking guys that she loves to com communicate with, both of them, and the only thing that sets these two men apart is what kind of car they drive and how much money they have. And if the woman wanted a family and a future, like I said, depending on the age, she is probably more likely going to choose the guy with the more money and a nice car over the broke dude with no car and drives a bicycle. The only reason why the girl would pick the broke guy is is of mostly obvious reasons. I won't mention it here, but you you all know what it is. You comment below if, if, if you think you know. So that being said, men, in today's world, whether or not you have that lucky gene to success or, or not, the thing I won't mention, you know what it is, whether you have it or not, uh, money and financial support is still necessary in every form. That requires good thinking, hard work, stoicism, competence, and all the other things that are admirable by mostly everyone in society, minus in the Antifa type. It sucks to get up early for work and then work all day and then practice your stoic demeanor with the assholes at your job, then catch a red light on the way home and then some dude in front of you in the line wants to play, uh, decides to play lottery and you just want to get home and relax on your sofa bed while you, so you could swipe uh, on your Tinder um, profiles. You feel no hope, you want to give up, so you think your sofa couch is a god's throne. And you hate that the females you talk to don't realize you're a god and they should realize that. But then you realize your couch isn't a throne at all but a seat that's barely keeping you above level ground, but slightly underneath. <laughs> the lack of control the lack of control is uh what gets most people frustrated or gives them anxiety. They want control. People want control. Some men would think that if they got their shit together, women should want to get to know them. Because they get all, you know, every, they think they get it all together. And then the men get pissed off when they don't get those opportunities with those women. And the women don't talk to them. A lot of people wish that they were a god that could cast storms down on those who don't act accordingly to their ideals. But that's not how the world works, at least not in Western societies. Frankly, nobody in the world is a god, and they all strive, everybody strives for something better, and they wish they had something better in in life rather than being content. Just imagine a world where everyone was comfortable with whatever they had. Everybody was content and cool. There'd be no deaths, no wars. Everybody would just be happy and cool. But people always want more. Women were stolen throughout history. They were traded, sold, and even given as, as gifts to people. Many Muslim sultans were gifted women, uh, that were then sat among other women that Muslim armies had captured throughout conquest. Native Americans gave women to Europeans as gifts, like uh, Malinche was given to Hernan Cortez, who in then uh, birthed uh, the first mestizo in America, which was uh, named Martin. Even the, the Muslim traveler named uh, Ibn Battuta was given a girl by her father as if she was just some piece of property, like gold or clothing or food or something like that. He's like, here... This is for you. I like you. You're my friend. You could have my daughter. And so the dude 
gave his daughter away to this traveling dude. And then Ibn married this girl. But he he also married other women as well. And I think he got divorced from some of them as well. I'm not... Um, I don't know Ibn's uh, story too too well. But through the through the throughout the centuries and throughout all the continents, women were kind of like property in every culture, it seems like. Um except for uh a lot of Native Americans uh didn't treat women like that. There's a lot of uh women that had equal rights, but then there was the slave women that were captured from uh other tribes and uh given to people, like I, I just mentioned. So anyways. Uh, some of the first women to arrive in America were paid for, and it was really easy for the average man to find a woman to share his life with throughout most of human civilization. It was a hunt. The older a person gets, uh, the harder it is to find a somewhat ideal woman. But I, dig I, dig I digress. Um, when Muslims and pagans, Jews, Christians sought after the acquisition of people in Africa and Eurasia, they usually had to fight battles to achieve this, so it wasn't easy. There was a lot of bloodshed in the world to uh, gather people, women and men, and create these cultures. It wasn't easy to find a girl, let alone the right girl. So let's take a look back in history and see if it was better then than it is now, or if there was a preferable, a preferable era at all, ever, for two people to come together. I have a, an American history channel here, but we can take a peek into other cultures and Trying to build up a timeline, timeline leading up to these uh, colonial American uh, memoirs and history notes. What were the what were the first women like in early America, and how easy was it for men to find a girl back then? Okay, we know that Egypt influenced Greece long ago to keep the bloodline in the family and to marry your cousin or some relative. Yeah, Egypt influenced Greece that way. It was said in Greece uh, influenced uh, Rome, and Rome uh, influenced lot, uh, Eurasia, right? Well, not so much Asia, but a lot of Europe. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of incest back then. They didn't want to ruin the bloodline and or dilute it with the lesser being, so they they populated with themselves. Cleopatra was a horn dog that did a ton of wild, sexual, weird things. But I but I guess that's uh, subjective, isn't it? Depending on what era. Or, uh, region of the world you live in. But I'm sure she got around and off on everyone and everything that she could back then. And Cleopatra even married her brother. Maybe even twice, I think it was. Uh, in ancient Egypt, the elite class uh, thought they were gods. So they wanted to keep their godly bloodline in the family. So sons screwed their mothers and sisters got on to their brothers and so on and so forth. Well, Consanguinity was uh, popular among the elite classes in Africa, Europe, and uh, Eastern states, and everywhere else. Although ancient China frowned upon these uh, types of relations with those with the same surname, there were some emperors uh, that got it on with their relatives in China. A lot of times, the peasant type uh, people, perhaps proletariat, or more or less even Lupin proletariat, would benefit mostly by the fact that if they had uh, four children, two boys, two girls, then neither would have to look for a husband or a wife because it was all in the family back then. Just imagine living on the farm way back in the day. Or if a brother had a son to marry his brother's daughter, then they didn't need to pay anyone for an arranged marriage or slave woman that was captured in battle or any other way to... They, they uh, bought w wives back then. But as the centuries rolled on, rules started to come up and ban incest relations and uh, with anyone in person's family within so many generations. People possibly being, began to panic when they had to uh, look elsewhere for women other than from within their own family network. But even f at that time, before that time, and, and after, there was a lot of captured women from battles. After an army defeated a city, town, or state, the soldiers take the women. And we see that throughout history in almost every culture. I can't think of one culture or race of people that hadn't done that. Islamic groups would take hundreds of those captured women into rooms. Christian states would have slave quarters. Mongolians had harems. Men want to get women in any way they can. And it's been like that for centuries and all of humanity. And a lot of the times it wasn't consensual at first. People uh, bought wives and then sold them. 
Every sultan of the Muslim Ottoman Empire that I know of had a mother who was originally a European Christian woman that was obtained either through war and conquest or trade. Therefore, she wasn't a free person at the initial exchange. And like I said earlier, none, she was, it was non-consensual, led, which led to consent, and often captured women would fight to have sex with their owners. The Muslim ruler, son of uh, Mehmed, who conquered Constantinople, the uh, Sultan Suleiman, had a, had a couple wives. And out of jealousy, uh, one of the wives nearly, uh, these wives almost killed each other one night to where one of the women that attacked the other lost uh, the battle by having her face scratched up and scarred up from the other one. And then so the attacker then hid herself from the husband for a really long time because she was so embarrassed with what she did and what happened to her face. The other one eventually got set, sent away. So, it was, it was, you know, women do crazy things, and so do men. So, women aren't only fought for, but they even fight each other for men and status throughout history. Incest, captured woman, and buying your wife uh, isn't really a popular thing here in the Western culture anymore. But I have a Muslim friend that lives down the street uh, from me. He's from Yemen that now lives uh, down the street. And uh, he didn't meet his wife until uh, he got married to her. Because it was it was an arranged marriage by his father, if I'm not mistaken. And Eastern countries have a different way of doing things in modern times. But when did the uh, Western civilization get to this point? How did how did it evolve? What were the first women like in America? Were they bought or stolen? Were they rich? They were they smart? Were they beautiful? To where they had good lives, or were they women on the bottom that ended up with the early vagabonds of America? I have a few books that reference this idea that that help me generate a bigger perspective. The first generations, uh, first generations women in colonial America, by Carol Birkin and Jamestown Brides, the story of England's maids for Virginia by uh, Jennifer Potter. And like I said earlier, who were these women, and were they healthy? Were they smart? Were they rich women? The author Jennifer Potter talks about the two women from England named Catherine Finch and. Audrey Hoare, who didn't necessarily need to go to America to find a husband. Both of these women had decent lives and good connections in an area that wasn't terrible at the time in England. So it doesn't make a total sense, a, a lot of sense why they came to America to hook up with a guy. America was a extremely dangerous place to live with no paved roads, no Starbucks, no strip malls, no Amazon Prime. But they had occasional disagreements with the natives at times, so that was one thing to look up to look forward to. Also, it wasn't easy to get food at times either, and one wife became uh, food to a angry, a hungry husband in the early uh, year of sixteen ten. The historical writings of the time said that he, uh, the husband, boiled her, and then, but this guy was soon executed afterwards for it. It was during the starving time. But why would women want to come to a place like America? All that the American men asked for in a woman was that she had to be health, be a healthy woman who knew how to do a few housewife things, and uh, and she had to be healthy. Did the women really need to go all that way uh, from England to America for that? One, one woman jumped a ship to avoid going to America when uh, she was just about to show up or to leave. She's like, screw this, I'm out of here. I changed my mind. She must have changed her mind right at the very last minute. Her name was uh, Joan Fletcher. So obviously the, the uh, women were nervous about making such a long trip for a husband. But women like to travel, so I'm sure the women were just as enthused about seeing America as they were anxious of what the future had in place for them, like a husband or whatever, whatever else. And not all women that came to America were single women. Of the first European women of uh, Virginia in the eastern part of America, um, there were women who had uh, made their way to Roanoke some decades before but failed to sustain a colony there. The first women of Jamestown were Mistress Forrest and uh, the maid Anne Buras. And Anne Buras was the first English marriage in the colony that eventually evolved into the United States in which is commonly called America for short. So we can say that Anne Buras was the first woman to get married in America. 
She and her husband had four female identified children some years later. They identified as women. So I'm going to mention a couple of the stories of uh, colonial women in the early 1600s and what their life was like and how, how um, they got married and so on and so forth. In 1652, an English woman named Rebecca Cole arrived in America with her husband, Robert. She had a couple of daughters from her first marriage and had a baby born in Maryland in the year 1653. They were a rich family at the time. Robert rented a 300-acre tobacco farm, and uh, they lived at a place referred to as Cole's Farm. They had a nice uh, life. The father made sure all the children learned to read the Bible. The children learned to read and write. The boys learned math, and the girls learned how to sew. That's how they did it back then. They had a daughter named Mary Cole, who had two siblings. And when Mary turned nine years old, her her mother, Rebecca, died in the year 1662, and then her father died in the year 1663. You see, early America was not an easy place to live, but the average age of people around the world in the, at the time was around 30, 35 years old, or maybe even 40, sometimes older, sometimes younger. They had fast lives, unlike the 21st century norm of European descent women who prefer uh, living alone. Many of them do, at least. And a 17th century woman had to think fast because life and death came a lot more quickly at that time. See, it wasn't always fair for women in, uh, back in the day. And so when the, uh, Mary's parents died, she and her two brothers had to uh, divide up the land and everything. And so um, when they died before she was like 11 years old. Isn't it crazy? The 300-acre tobacco farm that uh, her father owned wasn't going to be divided up equally between Mary and her two brothers, but instead the boys split up the land while Mary got some cattle in a bed and some other random things in the house that she could take with her when she gets married. I think the, the boys inherited the servants as well that were on the land, but instead Mary got the cows. And she uh, eventually got married to some dude named Ignatius Warren, who had a house and some land where Mary brought her kitchenware and the cows with, and they benefited from each other. But it wasn't so often that parents died or uh, the kids had to bury their parents. I mean, it was, it was more likely that the parents had to bury their children back in those days. And a lot of times uh, the, the children would die before uh, they were two years old or three years old, sometimes like not even one years old. So if a woman waited till she was 25, 30 years old to get married, she would be pregnant for like the next 15 years sometimes until she died, um, until she was like 35, 40 years old when she died. But she would be pregnant the whole time because a lot of the kids that she had, or a lot of times she got pregnant, the kids didn't live. And so they would keep trying again and again and again until the one of the babies actually survived. So women had it hard back then, being pregnant all the time. And besides that... Uh, the author, Carol Birkin, also points out how many of the women also ran into some difficulty of knowing which tasks to fit which gender role, which usually changed based on the region and culture at the time. The different uh, colonies and foreigners sometimes were confused by the then native English women of the colonies. And Birkins, Birkins assumes that all of the women knew one thing, though, that, that it was a man's world, who were also the majority of the Chesapeake colony at the time. I think throughout Jamestown and Virginia, the same thing. Men were the majority. Mar uh, Maryland would have uh, roughly six men to every one woman in the beginning, and then half that towards the end of the century, three to one. And unlike the Islamic slave trade in the Saharan, where Muslims favored women over men for obvious reasons, early Americans preferred male slaves for work on the farms instead, rather than sex. Thus, the majority of the servants and later slaves were men, which put the ratio of men to women, ratio of such. White servants and uh, slaves were the majority until later in the century when the black slaves outnumbered the white slaves. But this uneven number of men and women forced the men to work really hard to impress the women to marry him. It was difficult because 
If the planter wanted to marry a foreign servant girl, he would have to pay off her indenture and then wait until she's at least 25, 30 years old. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, people didn't live that, that long back then. So if a girl got married at 30, she only has near 10 years uh, left to get things done. And they would speedily have children and do all the things necessary before their end days approached. And many children also meant many possibilities. Meaning that 25% of babies that, um, 25% of babies didn't die at birth, but they died before they were a year old, 25%. And 40 40 to 50% of children died before they were 20 years old. And many died at birth. It was more common to bury their children in those days than it was for the children to bury their parents, like I said. Indian raids, wild animals, diseases, battles were things that were up against people trying to survive in those days. A lot of times there was no food. I, re- I rarely read about early Americans dying of natural old age. So most of the time, uh, the early colonists were dying from wars or disease or something like that, or no food. The planters died, and you know the people that owned the plantations, they died, like I just mentioned, that family. And then the indentured servants died, and then the slaves died. Nobody had a good life back then. Immigrants are what drove up the population of the uh, early colonists, since many children died young. By the time a couple has uh, a couple people have a baby that survives, by that time, then the parents die. You know, by the by the time the child's five, ten, fifteen years old, and so the population wasn't really growing from those families. So that's why the immigrants brought up the rise of more. Uh, families in, uh, in Amer- or more people, the population in uh, early America. But it wasn't easy finding a woman back then, because like I said, it was mostly men. Well, here's another story about a dude named William Farrar. I mentioned in my Slaves and Servants video about a man named William Farrar that, uh, who was related to this history YouTuber guy that I can't think of the name right now. Check that older video if you want to find out who the guy is, but... Uh, let me get into the stories. Um, there was a woman named Cicely who arrived in Virginia very young. She eventually married a dude named Samuel Jordan, and they lived on uh, 450 acres of fortified land, which saved many of the colonists from being slaughtered in the Indian Massacre of 1622. Samuel Jordan didn't survive, but his wife Cicely and others stayed safe in the fortified Jordan Journey plantation. And as soon as a single man learned about her husband's death, just a few days later, Men were approaching her and asking her on a date. She denied one guy named uh, Pooley because uh, she said it was too soon. But she will keep in mi- keep him in mind, she said. But not long after, Pooley and the other men caught her making out with William Farrar. Pooley went to the courts and complained about his heart being broken. The courts didn't stop the two lovers, though. And which soon, uh, soon after, Farrar married uh, Cicely and inherited her deceased husband's 450 acres and wife with two children. She may have been pregnant at the time as well. You know, within a week's time, the colony was ambushed and slaughtered by the Powhatan Indians. Her husband died. She was pregnant with already two, with two children already. And men were trying to date her, but she accepted the marriage just a few days after, uh, in the same week. Of, of her husband's death. Isn't that crazy? It goes to show you how much people really cared uh, a- cared about you after you died. She, she may have mourned for a minute, but if she was sleeping with a new guy a week later after raising uh, children whose faces resembled her late husband, that's pretty wild, but not surprising. She's like, this is your new dad. Your old dad is gone now. Now eat your breakfast. You see, a lot of uh, men back then had to pay for women uh, in early America and when women were sent over from uh, the English colonies. I'll get into it. But a lot of these men had to pay uh, pay a price for either their trip or pay it to the uh, investors. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of these women that came from uh, England weren't having, many of them weren't really down on, uh, on the bottom. They weren't really having a hard time, so it's uh it's uh interesting that they actually chose to come to America to find a husband. 
See, although London built this scheme to persuade the women to go to these men in America, it was not of romance, but London wanted Jamestown to succeed. And in order to do, to do that, they wanted uh, the men to have brides and make a family, have kids, and uh, to plant themselves on the soil in America to give more incentive to stay stay in uh, Jamestown, Virginia. The women chose out of their own free will to go to America, but like I mentioned, uh, Joan changed her mind and jumped ship. Uh, the women that arrived to America were given the choice to pick a husband, but the husband had to pay 150 pounds of tobacco for her. I would say, why don't we just stay friends? Just hang out at my place. Screw marriage. That's what I would say. This tobacco um, that the guys would pay for, if the, if the wives, if they found a girl that they liked and the girl liked them, then the men had to pay 150 pounds of tobacco. And this tobacco would then go back to the investors who helped make all this happen. So you can see it as buying a wife, but it was really paying for her travel fare, kind of. And I can assume that the men who didn't have enough tobacco wouldn't be getting a wife at the time. They would sit on their lonely, sit in their lonely cabins, petting on their uh, livestock instead. There were later groups of Europeans that arrived, um, and the women were free to the men and only asking for travel fare. So th things got easier, you know, later on and at different times for the men. But it always required money. Now there was something called a dowry where uh, where a woman's family would pay a, an amount of money to the husband at marriage. And this happened in a lot of different uh, areas. This payment would was to help the husband pay for his new new bride's living expenses. This practice can be traced all the way back to the Roman Empire. It was worldwide uh, practice, not by every culture, but that I know of. But it was popular among those that practiced it. Uh, dowry amounts were typically 500 to 1,000 pounds in England around the time. When England was losing its textile industry to a rival elsewhere, Englanders were going broke, and the population doubled, and so inflation grew, and people were in desperate need of more moolah. And this may be part of the reason why women chose to abandon London and risk their lives for chances, uh, a chance in, for a life in America. And after dowry became so popular and widespread, things started to get weird. And uh, then there were une unexpected amounts and unpaid unpaid dividends, which led to death, uh, divorce, and fights, and many other problems. Where Greece, Kenya, India, Pakistan, and a lot of other places uh, made dowry illegal. And it was an amount of money for a husband to take care of his wife with it. It wasn't actually a payment for a husband to be like, hey, thanks for doing this, man. Thanks for marrying her. Here's a few bucks. Go have some fun. But it, it was expected. It, it became expected. So it may have uh, persuaded a lot of women to go to America if the, if, uh, the women didn't have a family or money uh, to pay for the dowry. The dowry mostly re relied on the wealth of the bride's family. And if she came from a family where both parents were dead, a dowry would be almost impossible. And an overwhelmingly half of all the women's fathers that were not living at the time, uh, they, they, they married in Jamestown. The, mo, half the women. Which points to the evidence that most of these women had no financial backing for a dowry at the time. Back home in London. The conversations I had with different dudes I know in, is that women are expensive. And I bet a lot of modern day American men wished that they would get a, receive a large sum of money to take care of his new woman friends expenses just imagine going on a tinder date and a woman's family would have to pay come up with the money to uh pay for the first few nights out that would be rad hello young lad yeah it didn't work out with the last guy so here here's a couple extra dollars take it to a movie take it to the movie get her some ice cream have her as long as you want tonight keep her here's some cash have some fun then a lot of the women that were in London were maids. They were like uh, foreigners from other places where like their family died. Like I said, there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of the women, um, a lot of people, their parents died when they were really young. And so 
if both their parents died, then they had no money, so they had to become maids. And so if they were maids, then they were learning how to be a wife, but they didn't have money. So uh, they ended up, you know, getting married to, uh, you know, going to America with all the uh, things that they learned from being a maid. But it wasn't so lucky for the dudes in America in the early, early days because, like, they had to pay for the girls to come, right? They had to pay for a wife to where, like, back in London, they would get money from the family. So they, they kind of lost out, like, big time. They're like, damn it! And why weren't the women back then, like today's American white women, who a good amount of them prefer to live alone while visited by random men in between sleepovers with guys they prefer, uh, they refer to as best friends and sometimes gay? Well, societal influences play a big part in persuading of any individual's life. People can try to rationalize all they want their individuality, but sociological evidence clearly describes how everyone is just another sheep that belong to either a popular crowd or an outray of the deviant group. These groups all have their biases and reasoning and a rationale that conflicts with another's logic. Many times a group's rationale can be dangerous or life-threatening to a person or marginalized group of people. And a lot of stupid white people uh, thought they had the logic of facts to prove why they hated uh, anyone different skin tone back in the day. Muslims attacked Christians that didn't have, didn't have the same belief as they did about some dude in the sky that that existed. And it made total sense to them and why they killed people. Christians attack disbelievers, left-wing political groups, uh, American groups attack anyone that, that didn't think the way they do. In early 17th century, uh, Christian Americans, with sometimes European influence, were propagating the belief that women were inferior to men. And there were pamphlets and poems and books and posts on churches about how a woman should be, and how men should consider them. There were even biblical references. People can twist up any words and make, make them uh, mean what they want. People tend to believe whatever they read, so poems and books help with this persuasion. There are even songs written about how to regard women in those days. And a lot of these uh, propaganda tools spoke about how women should put themselves out for men, because virginity, virginity was frowned upon. And unmarried women were frowned upon. So societies uh, pushed all these beliefs on uh, the men and women. So it was, com it was a common thought and common talk back in those days. So this helped push women to get married in those days. The author, uh, Jennifer Potter, notes uh, many of these writings in her Jamestown Bride book, if you want to check it out. There were also preachers in church that wrote and spoke of how women should be such as the Eight Treaties of Domestical Duties by the uh, author William Gouge in the year 1622. But there was also a book that had uh, regarded as the first English written book uh, that wrote of women's rights. And I'm sure there were others, but some have regarded this one as such. But the book of uh, 1632, the author uh, Thomas Edgar wrote about women's rights in regards to age of consent dowry, polygamy, wooing, partition, property, divorce, respect, treason, felonies, rape, among other things. There were a group of uh, early American women who were not from London, but had resided there. Like I had mentioned before, a lot of the uh, people died young. So if a woman's parents died, and if this woman wasn't married, societal norms pushed her, pushed this unmarried woman with no chance of dowry to service other families, to be a maid, basically. So these women were single, with for, uh, were single foreigners who had uh, learned to be good housewives by their service of being a maid in another people's home. So some amount of these women made it to early America to become, to become these handy wives to these uh, planters. And some women, some women were treated very badly as servants, so they left... Uh, England for America, trading one burden for another, since the women were at the command of their husbands after marriage. The husband uh, spoke for his wife, and in America and England too, the husband spoke for his wife and took all of her rights upon himself. In modern times, promiscuity and male and female connections arise with the liberty of women speaking for themselves, hence why women cheat and divorce more 
often these days than in earlier centuries. The enslavement of freeborn Muslims and a lot of was Muslim communities the have their wives in check by promoting some myth that forces Body women to cover their body, the head, and sometimes their whole face to where only their eyes are shown. So men don't try to steal their wives away from these worried husbands. But there isn't much of this type of husband's control in Western societies in modern times. But maybe more of the opposite. But anyways. Now a lot of these women that came to America at different times had different prices on them. A lot of the early women that came to America were killed. So they were killed in the 1622 Indian Massacre that I have a video on. If you want to get deeper in insight into those happenings. But not all the slaves and women and planters were killed. But a, a majority of them survived. Like a little bit more than half, I think. Some of the women became slaves to the Indians and had been bought back. But for the women that survived the years of the massacre, uh, they became widowed at some point, and other single men would fight for her, their hand, like I mentioned before, since she obtained all the wealth of her husband. And a lot of single men preferred these to marry a widow over a payment of a newly arriving bride in America. But are things better now than they were then? I mean, people were more together back then. They had kids, if the kids survived. But as the decades and centuries rolled on, women's got, women got more rights. And uh, I don't think it became harder for men to, to, to get women. Because it was always hard for men to get women. Especially if they were in a rural community. And then there was the bigger cities that, you know, people got to see each other and to meet people a lot easier. But the, the rural people is who I'm focusing on. But even the bigger cities were invaded by armies and uh, a lot of the people were stolen from there, like women and slaves, men, men slaves from, uh, from either Eurasia or even Africa. But like this channel is mostly focusing on America, history. Um, I just want to make some references, some references to other parts of uh, history and other regions, and a reference to a modern times as well. So if you're a single guy and you think it's hard now, it's it was hard then too. It was hard on the women and it was hard on the men in different aspects. And I don't think the connection between two people will ever be easier than it always has been. Like I said, a lot of it depends on your age and your generation. Then how much money you have and your success. So anyways, that was, just, that was a closer look at colonial women, colonial times, and, uh, and how men obtained wives and how their families went. And how, how, how hard women had it. Anyways. Subscribe and stay tuned for the next video. Subscribe and hit thumbs up. Comment. Adios.